아, what I'm going to be talking to you about is stuff that I and Heidi and a few other people have known <coughs> for at least a month or two or more. That is that as far as the technology of this is concerned, we're at an inflection point or a transition point. I think as far as most of us have been concerned, Martin accepted, this has been sort of, how should I put it, a hobbyist activity. Fooling around, building stuff, trying to get it to work, so on. Not worrying too much about this or that but worrying very much about deluding ourselves, making sure not to do that. Uh, <clears throat> frankly, when I came to the conference, I knew George was coming, for example, but George for the last two years, since I, since I sent him the device that he has in his lab, has asked that I treat him anonymously. That is to say, not tell anybody who he was. So I've been telling people, oh yes, Anonymous is getting suits. Uh, Nembo was more forthcoming and willing to be out there in public and say his piece and all that. And I went out of my way to have him say his piece rather than try to say his piece for him. You know. <clears throat> because I wanted you to hear what he had to say, not what I had to say about what he had to say. <laughs> what I did not count on was that Martin had a device and that he was hot on the train. Uh, all of that has come as, frankly, a pleasant surprise. What it's also done is it's made clear that irrespective of whatever, whatever other machinations other individuals and institutions become involved in, that we are likely at the outset of finding a path to a way to get around space-time quickly, which all of us collectively and individually have been involved in, many of us, for many, many years. So, when it came time to do the presentation, I had a whole bunch of slides, some new, some old, all that. <clears throat> and I kept shuffling them around and putting them in folders and making little PowerPoint clips and things like that. But I couldn't decide how to go about doing this presentation. As a historian, the logical thing to do is start out with some historical background and build up and so on. But I decided that wasn't the right thing to do today. I decided that rather than do that, and as it worked out, it was very convenient because as usual, I was late. <laughs> I decided to have Heidi and Lance and Jeremiah and Nembo talk part of my time while I put the final PowerPoint together. <laughs> okay, so what you're going to see is in inverse order, pretty much, what the slides would have been if, if it had been a historical Set up. Okay, first slide. First, just basically so. Uh, now. Okay, we're in business. Okay, first part's just a little thing on the construction of the devices that George, Martin, Nembo, Heidi, and I are running. Where's the fourth one? Oh, well. Anyway, a bunch of people are now running them in both Europe and the United States. And they're all getting basically the same thing with the sort of variations that you would probably expect with the completely different systems and <coughs> enthusiasms for calibration, <laughs> I will put it, okay. <clears throat> the way these things are made was taught to me by a fellow named Jim Sloan, who was the Edo Plant Ops Manager in Fullerton, 
many years ago. Ido left California around 1990 to move to Utah because of taxes, of course. And <clears throat> they had a bunch of PZT disks left over, a variety of sizes, but mainly a cache of really neat EC65 three quarter inch diameter disks. And guess what diameter disks are in the devices that are presently running? Okay? The way you put these things together is you make electrodes. And there's a much more high tech way of doing this than the way I do it. <coughs> I do it by taking a bunch of two, thousand, two mil thick brass foil and making up a stack of it and then clamping it all together on a drillable surface and drilling a bunch of 30 second inch holes in the electrode so that the adhesive that you use, which is a special set of epoxies, it's not just stuff you go down to the hardware store and buy. And you put them together this way. Each of the disks is polarized. There's a plus and minus side. You set them up so that the pluses face each other which means automatically the minuses face each other and so on, okay? And then you glue them together and clamp them. And that stack that results, the PZT stack, is <clears throat> preloaded onto a brass reaction mass. You perhaps heard us talking casually about react brass reaction masses. We've recently discovered <clears throat> that we get much better behavior out of the stacks that we're running in Fullerton with three quarter inch long brass reaction masses. And not knowing that Martin was running one of our devices, we brought reaction masses for George and Nembo so that they can improve the performance of the devices they have. <clears throat> they are held together with 256 uh, stainless steel cap screws. The cap on there, the aluminum cap that <clears throat> puts the preload on the stack, and then the brass reaction mass <clears throat> is attached to an L bracket of eighth inch of thick aluminum channel uh, with 440 machine screws. And when you get done, the uh, schematic longitudinal section on the left is an antique. It's from the time when I made the stack that Martin has. And there's another person present in this room who has one of those stacks, too. <laughs> They're sort of, I guess, trophies or something like that at this point. Okay. There's one more in existence that I know of, and I'm not letting go of that one. Okay. On the right is one of the present devices. They are made with Snyder Martin's 111 material, which has excellent electromechanical properties and very low dissipation. 0.4% thermal dissipation in these things in operation. Okay, that is a stack, by the way, <clears throat> which has a 5 eighths of an inch thick brass reaction mass, which is what I used for some time, actually Heidi and I used for some time, uh, because it gives a nice complex resonance pattern when you do a 30 kilohertz sweep about a central frequency. Okay, it's got lots of bouncing like that. And the idea behind that was visitors coming by would rather see something bounce around than something go like that. Okay. Okay, this is just another picture of one. These things, by the way, are mounted in Faraday cages, <clears throat> which are made of aluminum project boxes, roughly two by one, two by two by three and a half, I think, or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> and they are mounted in particular in a way so that when you reverse the direction of the device on the end of the balance beam, all that reverses is the device itself. It's bolted on to that Faraday cage in such a way that the bolt is on the axis of the beam, okay? So that you don't introduce unwanted torques and things of that sort. 
Okay, this, by the way, is Nembo's, and it speaks for itself. Okay, now we're getting into recent data. Uh, perhaps we'll run across one of those sweep type uh, <coughs> data runs, but this was one that was done about two months ago, and it's using the device that's now in use with the three quarter inch reaction mass. And we set it up because the transients turn out to be the really important part of these signals. When people build these things and go tooling off to wherever they choose to go and all that, they may be using the steady thrust state of these devices for certain purposes, but for raw power, they're gonna be using the tr switching transients, okay? And by the way, if you <clears throat> have in mind that you might wanna go home and sit down and write down a patent specification for this, don't bother. The SSI already has the patent assigned, okay? <coughs> the switching transients are the things of interest. The what this is, is a sweep for 50 seconds where you go in and then at zero and the way this is set up now, the device is turned on at the resonance frequency, okay? It is left on at the resonance frequency for eight seconds. It's turned off for eight seconds. It's turned back on for eight seconds, and then the tail goes out. And you can see the distinctive features of this thing. The switching transient here is obvious. The bounce back is also obvious. It's not obvious whether the bounce back is a matter of the resonance changing frequency because of heating, and this is still powered or not, but that ans the answer to that question of whether or not that's just overshoot or something that's powered is answered over here when it's turned off because you get the same sort of switching transient and the overshoot, okay? So what you're looking at is overshoot. The switching transient when it comes on, in this case is negative, when it turns off it's positive, and you'll notice that if you keep this part in mind that this is a little bit below that. Unfortunately, or fortunately, this is a little bit farther down, and so on. So you've clearly got some thermal drift here. And whether or not there is a visible steady thrust component of these things or not is not obvious, at least not from this. This is for the reverse direction. You'll notice that everything's going the opposite direction, but it's not as big. The reason why it's not as big is because these systems have responses in them that had we gobs and gobs of money and a legion of helpers and all that, we could probably suppress. But for our purposes, all we need to do is take this and subtract it from the previous one to get this. Okay. And now you can answer the question about whether or not there is steady force when the switching transient and its overshoot gets done? And the answer is yes, because here it is down here, and there's the thermal drift line up here. Okay, so there is a steady force as well as the switching transient in this. Yes? Shouldn't it be the average? The switching transient is going down, okay? Yeah. And then shouldn't the thrust appear uh, not necessarily, and if you, and if you don't want to take my word for it, <laughs> you can ask Jose about how complicated these things are. He's done modeling of these things and has made plain to us that a lot of stuff that was not really obvious to us really is something that's expected on the basis of a well-worked-out and carefully done model. His work has been Essential, I think, is the right way to put this. You know, he and Heidi have also been having a lot of fun emailing back and forth. You know. <clears throat> but from his modeling, it's clear that what we're looking at is, you know, because it's a model based upon the effect, it's not a model based upon noise. Okay, 
So we know we get a steady thrust and all that. Now, if you're going to go after switching transients, another thing that's obvious from this is that this switching transient goes negative, where this switching transient goes positive, <coughs> and they are about the same size, which means if you had a device in your spaceship and you put one of these things in it and you warmed it up and got it going, it wouldn't go anywhere because every time it switches down this way, the next time it switches up this way, and you just sit there and vibrate. Okay? So, what you want to do is you want to get rid of one of the two switching transients. And Heidi and I kicked the idea around, and I don't recall whether she or I had the idea, but it, it's a fairly straightforward idea to do what we call chirping. <clears throat> this, by the way, is some individual traces that went into those things which were averages of about a dozen cycles. Okay. That's what the raw data looks like. Okay. This is with some more information on it. The brown trace is the accelerometer, so you can see mechanically what's going on in the thing. <clears throat> and I apologize for flipping through all of these if I had been a little bit more <clears throat> organized. I would have cut all that stuff out. <laughs> but as it was, all of Tidy talking about quantum gravity <clears throat> diverted you while I was doing this. Okay. Uh, color code so that you know what you're looking at. The voltage control, volt the voltage control, the oscillator control voltage is green. <clears throat> this is the trace. I think this is the trace. Is this the one you use, Gary? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> when I first rewrote, one of the things that went into this was rewriting the code for a program that hadn't, I hadn't touched in about seven or eight years. Uh, and that took a while. Okay. But it got done. And eventually, where this started out with just a linear ramp, it got put into a so-called quadratic ramp. This is quadratic there and patched with quadratic the other way to get rid of the inflection points of a simple linear ramp. The reason why is because even an inflection point in the control voltage produces enough of a transient effect in the thrust so that it garbages up what you look at. Okay, So if you're going to do something like this, you want to be sure to use smoothly <clears throat> operating control voltages. Some more chirps, more chirps, details of chirps, okay? And as you can see, the incoming voltage goes down a little bit here and then back up to a steady voltage, and then when it's turned off, you get your large transient, okay? This is good news, because what it means is that it's not going to be some subtle, difficult, complex, technologically challenging process that needs to be used in order to kill one of the two transients. That is to say, it's going to be easy to make space drives, okay? Or easier than it could have been. <laughs> There's another of those, more of this, okay, more. As I say, we can generate large amounts of data, okay? <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to hold this down, and hopefully this will cycle through so that you get sort of a move, motion picture effect. No motion picture effect. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <coughs> oh, 
what you can see in these is the power spectrum, and in this case, the actual waveforms. Blue is, of course, voltage, and red is the thrust trace. <clears throat> this slide is included to answer a question that might be niggling around at the back of your mind. Switching transients, of course, are commonplace events in electronic circuits. And indeed, sometimes you spend a lot of time trying to kill them because they can do n nasty things to sensitive circuits. Uh, so the obvious question is, when you get switching transients of the sort that you've seen, are you looking at the real effect? Is this a mock effect that's actually producing, as Heidi would say, a mock effect gravity assist drive? Okay, that is to say, a mega drive, as opposed to a MET. Okay, or is it not? Is it just simply an electronic effect in the equipment? Okay, <clears throat> the way to find out, of course, is to do some switching of voltages to see what happens. In this case, what we've done is we've taken a DC amplifier and put it into the secondary circuit of the setup so that it can be switched between 0 and 115 volts. The voltage waveform applied in those previous slides that you saw had an amplitude of about 100 volts, so that this is just a little bit higher than the amplitude of the voltage waveform. <coughs> the reason why you do that is, one, because you don't want to blow stuff up, and two, because you want to answer another question which this answers, does applying a voltage to a PZT, which causes its length to change, and consequently the center of mass of the device on the end of the balance to change, and consequently the beam to move, is that what accounts for part or all of what we're looking at? Okay. So by applying a DC voltage, and the other one of reversing the direction of these things, you can get rid of almost everything that might be accounting for these things other than the real thing that you're looking for, okay? This plot is a plot of 115 volt DC pulses applied eight seconds on, eight seconds off, as in the case of the other traces where you saw the big transients and all that, okay? And it's an average of about, did I hear a hint of a question? No, okay. <clears throat> as you can see, there's absolutely nothing there, okay? There's just barely the faintest trace of something where with a lot of wishful thinking you might think, gee, there might be some small effect due to a change in the center of mass or what have you, okay? But it is obvious from this trace that changes in the center of mass and switching transients of the normal sort in electronics are simply not responsible for the transients that you see with these devices. <coughs> Which means, along with the fact that all of this is now being replicated in four labs worldwide, might I say, you know, that uh, we may well be at the beginning of the path of what promises to be an interesting and not always unchallenging <coughs> journey. Okay, this is more of this. Uh, that's a schematic of a thrust balance I included for the fun of it. That's another picture of a mat. That's it on the end of the beam. That's the Fullerton thrust balance, <coughs> which is a ripoff from Martin's thrust balance when he was at ARC, which was ripped off from Andy Ketzdever, I understand it as. See? Yes. <laughs> There's been a certain amount of evolution of thrust balances. When Andy put his together, it was the most sensitive for thrust balance in the world. When Martin put his together, it was the most sensitive thrust balance in the world. When we built ours back in 2005 or six, something like that, it was, it was a while ago, it was the most sensitive thrust balance in the world. There are now, as I understand it, lots of these thrust balances, and many of them are considerably better than this one. Okay, uh, just a few things. That's a Faraday cage. You'll notice the 
classy red plastic and aluminum here, yoke. That's included so that you can simply loosen a nut on the end of the thrust balance beam here and simply rotate the device on the end of the thrust balance. <coughs> the device itself, I think you can see it probably in one of these. This is a central column with the gallon sand contacts, as you can see they are carefully aligned so that they are coaxial with the thrust bearings so that when current goes through the sort of stuff that George was talking about is not a serious problem. Okay, And you can also see these are the flexural bearings that are used in all of these thrust balances. Okay, <coughs> I can't pass up the chance to mention the mascot of our efforts. That's Croc. Okay. <laughs> uh, and there's a little story about a minute or two. I went to a symposium years ago, <clears throat> back when I was teaching, and a colleague was giving a talk on medieval and early modern alchemy, alchemy in the time of Newton in particular. And she was talking along and showing slides and so on and so forth. And one slide came up, and it was a slide of the hearth of the alchemist of the 17th century. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this big log-like thing hung above the <laughs> mantelpiece of the uh, fireplace. And so I asked, what's the log? And she said, oh, that's not a log. That's a stuffed, a stuffed crocodile. <laughs> and I said, what's a stuffed crocodile doing hanging from the ceiling in front of the place where the alchemists were? And she said, oh, all self-respecting alchemists in the 17th century, it was a mark of their having made it, of having stuffed crocodiles over the area where they work. So, of course, when I went home, I told Carol, I said, we need to keep our eyes out for stuffed crocodiles. <laughs> I've got a place for one. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she knew I was serious. So the next day, she went down to Toys R Us and got Croc to head me off from a pointless and tedious attempt to find a stuffed crocodile for the, uh, for the lab. OK, this is the last thing I'm going to tell you about. And only in a couple of minutes, we're almost done. You'll be able to get a cup of coffee and <clears throat> reinvigorate yourself and all that in a few minutes. About a year and a half ago, uh, as many of you know, and the rest of you are welcome to get involved in this, I've run an email list for many, many years. As a matter of fact, Paul March was the one who started it back around 2000, I think it was, and then left it in my hands a year or two later, and <laughs> so on. <coughs> Anyway, about every week or two, I send out an email and talk about progress. And I do it partly to keep people in, who are interested up to date in what's going on. And also, I do it partly to make sure that I keep doing stuff so that I've got something to say. And if you're not on the email list and would like to be, let me know. Anyway, uh, several years ago, Jack Sarfati and a bunch of his friends got added to the email list which livened things up at times very significantly, as those of you on the list know. Uh, and one of the people that Jack brought along with him is Nick Herbert, the author of the book Faster Than Light, Loopholes in Physics and so on. You know, and Nick is an absolutely first-rate physicist. Okay? And he said, you know, I've been looking at your equations, and if you look at the equations and you do the excitation the way you do, and with the devices we're now running, you can excite them with a single sinusoidal waveform because the sinusoid produces a piezoelectric effect in the device, but since the material is electrostrictive, it has a quadratic response. That is to say, at the second harmonic, you also excite an electromechanical response. And it turns out that that second harmonic response is precisely in the right phase to interact with the mass fluctuation at 
the second harmonic, to produce the sort of effects that I've showed you here this afternoon. Okay? And so Nick said, you know what that means, don't you? And I said, well, yeah, I suppose, you know, it's what I said. And he said, no, it means that this should scale as the fourth power of the voltage, okay? That modest changes in the voltage should produce very large changes in the signals that you see. And I thought, oh, rats, he's right. And I must admit that there was a moment of hesitation because you think, gee, I haven't done this yet. What happens if I do it and it doesn't work? You know, <laughs> when you do this sort of stuff, you always have that in the back of your mind, okay? You always have the email that you will send out to everybody saying, sorry folks, it didn't work, <laughs> in the back of your mind. I got over that fairly quickly. <coughs> and then, <coughs> then it occurred to me that there was a real problem because I was running the thing at about the limits of the system that was running at the time. And that talk of, took me about 30 seconds to get over. And I realized that instead of increasing the voltage, I could do the same thing simply by decreasing the voltage, taking the peak voltage that I was starting out with, and then reducing the voltage in increments and seeing how it affected the thrust traces. And that's what this is. It's a test to see whether or not cortic voltage scaling is what you actually see. Okay, and I'll let you read this stuff. This is a uh, block diagram of the power circuit, the computer control of the re relay which turns the signal generator off and on. That feeds the power amplifier. There's an isolation and step-up transformer, voltage sense, and then the device. <clears throat> this is a thing about doing sweeps like this. <clears throat> Are you going to put these slides up or something like that on the SSI website, Gary? Yes, all the slides. Some of them, maybe. Okay. I, I will edit it to get, yes, down to more manageable levels. Okay, here we are at low voltage. And as you can see, there are some very light lines that show you the measured size, amplitude of the thrust, event, okay, this is the next voltage up, that's medium low, this is the next voltage up, and did I overshoot one, there it is, full voltage, okay, and you can see the forest of resonances between the two center frequency pulses there, that Jose's model actually replicated, much to my amazement. I didn't expect that. Okay. And if you want to see this in graphical form, okay, here's some more stuff that you can... <coughs> there it is in graphical form. The red line is a crude fit to a cortic voltage, simple cortic voltage scaling, okay? And the answer is that it passes the test, okay? So now you have multiple places where results are being obtained. You know that it cortically scales with the voltage, as indeed it should, that when you reverse the device, it changes the direction of the thrust, and you can subtract them from each other to get rid of, in effect, common mode noise, and so on. And the effects are roughly of the order of magnitude of what you'd expect from the crude version of the derivation that I've done. Okay. That leading term is there. Jim? Yeah. Uh, how come, it's George here, how come the error bars are higher or larger uh, when your thrusts are larger? As opposed to, I would have thought when you're, when you're, not, when you're down with low thrusts. That's you know, Those are not aero bars of the sort that you would expect. Those are not, 
they aren't root mean square, so they're not standard deviations. They're the ex full range of all of the ones that went into the averages. Okay. All right, so it's, it's not a standard deviation. It's not a classical, simple standard deviation type of thing. My estimate of what a reasonable error <coughs> error envelope would be are the circles or the ellipses that are rather that are drawn there. That's the most likely place to find the next observation. You know, at about the 80% confidence level or thereabouts. Okay. Any other questions? I put you on. It's on scaling. So you have a kilogram device and 250 volts and microns of thrust. What would it take for mega newtons? You don't want to go straight to heavy lift, is the way we put it. Well, I, 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 I was wondering, yeah, is, it, is the scaling practical? The yes, the scaling is practical. Where that scaling is going to eventually go, and how quickly it will go there, I'm not sure, is very likely into the high megahertz to low gigahertz region. Whether they will be EM drive type devices or whether they'll be solid state devices like the ones we're running is not obvious to me yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if they turn out to be solid state devices because cavities have a lot of extra baggage that isn't present in a solid state type of device. The optimum running conditions for these devices, for any device of this general type, is typically sometime right of some a frequency right about a gigahertz or thereabouts, because if you get too much above that, you get above the, what do they call it? In that thing you dug up, Paul, years ago. You want to be sure that when you apply the electric field to whatever it is you're inducing all this stuff in, that it's the ions that respond, not the electrons in the lattice. Okay? Because if the electric, if you're just bouncing around a bunch of electrons, you don't get it. The effect is down by three orders of magnitude. But just the uh, obviously, it, 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 the, the thrust is from pushing and pulling. Uh, so you might think to get big thrust, you need to push and pull on big things, and then they're too heavy to lift. Is it just for like an ion? Once you get it into deep space, it can have a feeble little push. Or, you know, can you really get these big numbers? In other words, what you're asking, I take by that, is are these things space drives in the sense that ion engines and stuff like that are? Or are these capable of heavy lift? Yeah, yes. These will eventually be capable of heavy lift. And how big, if they, obviously it can't be bigger than the payload. They're, they, will, they're, they will be built up on very large arrays of units, probably probably about the size of what we're working with now, or maybe a little, little smaller. And they'll probably be plug-in replaceable elements as they die or need to be refurbished, so on. Uh, if I can ask one question, then make one suggestion. So the scaling is quartic with power. What is it with frequency? It's cortic with free with voltage. With voltage, okay. Okay, which is the square root of the power. Okay. Right. It's cortic with voltage, and then what is it with frequency? Frequency is a tougher thing. A lot of things that go into the equations, both the Mach effect equation and the mechanics equation that you have to add in. The thing, the mechanical oscillation of the device at two omega. <laughs> that has to be added to the mass fluctuation have the frequency in them. And if you just go through and extract the frequency from every factor in this equation, you can deceive yourself into thinking, my God, these things scale with frequency to the sixth power. All I have to do is go up 10 volts and I'll be able to move my house. <laughs> you know, it's not like that. The frequency, of course, is tied to other things that the frequency describes. And when you scale the frequency up, those things change too. So the practical scaling with frequency 
is probably on the order of fre somewhere between frequency squared and frequency cubed. So running at higher frequency is clearly a thing to do. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's three point. Running at higher frequency is clearly a desirable thing to do because it goes as somewhere between the square and the cube of the frequency. So if you... And then my suggestion, you already started on it. Uh, if, you know, for future readers, some concept thoughts on what a heavy lifter might look like, even if you obviously can't define all the parameters, you know, some sort of sense of direction might be useful. I, I think we're at a point now where I can lead in to Jan's talk this evening and tell you that the one case that the AIAA deemed worthy of taking a look at back in the early 1970s of flying saucers and all that stuff, which is something that's always just an arm's length away, if not closer in this business. Okay. The one case that they had is called RB47 which is a reconnaissance B-47 with passive electronics countermeasures. These guys got shadowed by something that was giving off RF, very powerful RF, okay? And as it turned out, it was giving off X-band radar <laughs> emissions. That is to say, somewhere around two gigahertz or thereabouts. But it wasn't just a simple continuous 2 gigahertz signal. It was a 2 gigahertz signal pulsed with two microsecond pulses, okay? And with a pulse repetition rate of 600 hertz, okay? And that was lifting whatever it was that was following them, okay? As I say, in my opinion, that's the only piece of hard data that you can extract from that community. But the people who made the observations knew what they were doing. They were all radar experts, and they knew how to run their equipment. And their equipment told them that that was what was happening, that they were listening. They thought they were listening to radar. In fact, what they were probably listening to is the noise from the power plant, from the drive. So, so so you know where the goal is. Where we are is something that runs at about 36 kilohertz and has all of the properties that we've talked about and produces transients on the order of a few micronewtons. Okay, so there's a very, very long way to go from here to there. But if you know what the goal is, it's like having the answer at the back of the book. <laughs> you know? We have the answer at the back of the book very likely. Yeah. So basically, Jim, a heavy lifter will become an array of bats, an array of bats plastered to the skin, effectively, or in the skin, or in the skin. Correct. Over the so you get surface area times thrust per unit, mm -hmm. and each one producing ten newtons. You, you do the math. The form of arrays are extremely hard to get time correctly. I didn't <laughs> say it was easy, but that's just engineering. It's just engineering. <laughs> Scaling these devices, if you scale these devices at frequency squared from 35 kilohertz to 2 gigahertz, that by itself, okay, with the only frequency squared scaling would probably get you what you want. Okay, but running these things at running these things with what we know about them now at two gigahertz would probably not work because you don't really know what you're doing. And anybody who's act, been active in this business knows that if you try to scale by more than a factor of five to at most an order of magnitude in a step, and especially if you try to scale more than one thing at a time, you're just asking for trouble. You will get lost. Yep. We should be a little cautious here because we've not been talking about gravity waves or any kind of emission of any kind. So uh, uh, we got these going to have these thrusts and possibly embedded in something. We, we really don't know how that's going to respond, how we come close together. So until we've done some experiments on that, I'm not going to. 
um, I would say <laughs> Heidi's being cautious. <laughs> we have to do EMC electromagnetic compatibility yeah. testing for gravitational inertia devices. Yeah. And how does these gravity waves, if there are any, we can see that we can use we relate to the thrust. We need to figure that out. Uh, a caution. We're throwing around the word scaling. There's two levels of scaling. There's a single scaling from a single device, and there is array scaling. Okay, mm -hmm. and array scaling can be um, you can have nested arrays. So Jim uses a stack of single devices within them, and that stack becomes an element in a larger array. But then you run into a line replaceable unit problem. You know, the person on the ship or the artificial intelligence having to replace a unit and with a good one. And so you can you basically have nested arrays two or three layers deep. We've been looking at, well, I've been looking at some of the manufacturing problems and some of the issues that you have uh, with that. And it's an interference issue that gets very complex very fast. There's a very, very long way to go, and there's a lot of hard work between where we are now and what's, what is ultimately, I take to be our collective objective. But at least we've got some physics that tells us which way we should be going and, and what's likely to work. Yeah. And probably, I think it would be fair to say that as short a time ago as six months to a year or two ago, that was arguably not the case. There were a few individuals running around saying, I know what to do, I know what to do. I was one of them. Nobody was paying much attention. <laughs> they may not pay attention after my telling you about RB47, <laughs> but, but that would probably be a mistake on their part. Any other questions? Coffee. <laughs>